Saturday, July 18th, 2020, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Hopefully today is the uh, first part of many videos relating to a book I just received in the post a couple of days ago. Um, it's not a book written by anyone, but it's a series of letters written by William Cobbett. Uh, the name of the letters are Paper Against Gold, containing the history and mystery of the Bank of England, the funds, the debt, the lowering and the raising of the value of paper money. I'd never heard of William Cobbett. <laughs> I have to thank uh, one of my viewers from Northern Ireland who sent me an article in which the... Uh, present-day writer spoke about William Cobbett. Then I was able to get one of his uh, series of letters that was put into this book. Uh, this is what the publisher says about uh, the printing of these letters. It says, due to the very old age and scarcity of this book, many of the pages may be hard to read due to the blurring of the original text. Possible missing pages, missing text, dark backgrounds, and other issues uh, are beyond our control. Because this is such an important and rare work, we believe it is best to reproduce this book regardless of its original condition. Thank you for your understanding. And I found that uh, comment there, or that printing statement they call it, very interesting because I've just finished letter one and that's what I'm going to go over today. Hopefully I'll make uh, this like a series and I think it's very interesting and it applies uh, very much uh, for today and what's happening to our monetary system. I had a question recently in one of the comments. One of my friends uh, said, oh, this is what the writer of the comment said, one of my friends said that uh, the powers that be are bringing down the middle class and that gold is going to 800. Hopefully going through this uh, will help you uh, and your friend understand that, um, yeah, if the powers that be, the bankers, the people in charge really want to bring down the middle class, uh, the best way to do it is to inflate away their currency to make it worthless. And if gold goes down to 800, it means that uh, they're actually reining in the money printing. And that would actually have the opposite effect of what your friend is talking about. Have you noticed how the national debt uh, is going uh, through the roof uh, in every major country? Well, that's the issuing of debt. That's more paper money or fiat currency, if you, if you want to call it. And um, before I go into the first letter uh, by William Cobbett, let's look at William Cobbett and who he was. So this is what Wikipedia says about William Cobbett. Uh, born March 9th, 1763. Died June 18th, 1835. Was an English pamphleteer. I guess that's the equivalent of a blogger these days, a pamphleteer, independent journalist, member of parliament, and a farmer born in Farnham, Surrey. He, with a popular agrarian faction, argued that reforming parliament, including abolishing rotten boroughs, unnecessary foreign activity, and suppression of wages would promote internal peace and ease the poverty of farm laborers and smallholders. He was among the pre-party lobbies who backed lower taxes, saving, and preferably reversing enclosure of the commons and resistance to the 1821 adopted gold standard. That doesn't mean he was against the gold standard. He was against uh, the kind of gold standard they adopted uh, back after a period of uh, paper uh, money. So that was uh, William Cobbett and he wrote these letters interestingly in prison. Uh, he was in prison from 1810 uh, to 1812. 
He was a member of parliament from 1832 to 1835. Uh, this is the reason why he was in prison. It says Coppet was found guilty of treasonous libel on 15 June 1810 after objecting in the register, that was a publication or a pamphlet, to the flogging at Eli of local militiamen by Hanoverians. He was sentenced to two years imprisonment in, in Newgate Prison. While in prison, he wrote the pamphlet Paper Against Gold, warning of the dangers of paper money and also many essays and letters. On his release, a dinner was held in his honor in London, attended by 600 people and directed by Sir Francis Burdett, or Burdett, not sure how you pronounce that, who, like Cobbett, was a strong advocate of parliamentary reform. So that was William Cobbett. I never heard of the guy until I got this article uh, earlier this week. So let's get on with the first letter uh, in uh, Paper Against Gold. So here's the book. You can find it uh, on Amazon. I think it was about seven or eight pounds. It's not that expensive. You see that I've marked it with a, a Bank of England note. <laughs> um, so this is uh, his letter one when he was in prison uh, in Newgate, 1810, Paper Against Gold. Uh, Gentlemen, during the last session of Parliament, a committee, that is to say 10 or 12 members of the House of Commons, were appointed to inquire into the cause of high price of gold bullion, that is gold not coined. So you see uh, gold bullion is bars, usually that's what it was back then, uh, sovereigns or other gold coins or coins and to take into consideration the state of circulating medium or money of this country. This committee have made a report, as they call it, but it is a great book that they have written and have printed, a book much larger than the whole of the New Testament. Of this report, I intend to enter into an examination, and as you have recently felt, and are still feeling some of the effects of paper money. I think it may not be amiss if upon this occasion I address myself to you. I have introduced myself to you without any ceremony, but before we part we shall become well acquainted, and I make no doubt that you will understand the distinction between paper money and gold money much too well for it to be in the power of any one ever again to deceive you, which understanding will, in the times now fast approaching, be of great utility to all those amongst you who may have the means of laying up money, however small the quantity may be. The committee above mentioned, which for brevity's sake I call the Bullion Committee, sent for several persons whom they examined as witnesses touching the matter in question. There was Sir Francis Baring, for instance, the great loan maker and goldsmith, the rich Jew whose name you so often see in the newspapers, where he is stated to give grand dinners to princes and great men. So there you go, uh, Baring, Baring's Bank. Uh, Baring's Bank, of course, went bust in the 90s uh, because of Nick Leeson. The evidence of these and other money dealers and merchants, the bullying committee have had printed, and upon this evidence, as well upon the report itself, we shall have to make some remarks. The result of the committee inquiries is, in substance, this, that the high price of gold is occasioned by the low value of the paper money, that the low value of the paper money has been occasioned, as you know, the low value of apples is, by the great abundance of it. So the law of supply and demand, there you go, um, nothing new. That the only way to lower the price 
of the gold is to raise the value of the paper money and that the only way to raise the value of the paper money is to make the quantity of it less than it now is. Thus far, as you will clearly see, there was no conjuration required. The fact is that not only do these propositions contain well-known and almost self-evident truths, but these truths have, during the last two or three years, and especially during the last year, been so frequently stated in print that it was next to impossible that any person in England able to read should have been unacquainted with them. But having arrived at the conclusion that in order to raise the value of the paper money, its quantity must be lessened. Having come to this point, the rest of the way was more difficult for the next object was to point out <laughs> the means of lessening the quantity of paper money. And this is an object which, in my opinion, will never be affected. So he doesn't think they'll do what it takes. Uh, that would mean uh, they, they'd have to write down loans, um, just like uh, the central banks nowadays, ECB. Uh, that was the last thing they wanted to do when Greece was almost going bust. They didn't want to write off the loans, right? So same thing then. Unless those means include the destruction of the whole mass. So that, that's what it means. Just uh, writing off the loans. Uh, destroying the paper money because they're they're created on the back of loans. Not so, however, think the gentlemen of the bullion committee. They think, or at least they evidently wish to make others think that it is possible to lessen the quantity of the paper money and to cause guineas to come back again and to pass from hand to hand as in former times. Uh, guineas are coins that a little uh, more gold than a sovereign, uh, the guinea. They would fain to have us believe that this can be done without the total destruction of the paper money. And indeed, they have actually recommended to the House of Commons to pass a law to cause the bank in Threadneedle Street, London, commonly called the Bank of England, to pay its notes in real money at the end of two years from this time. Well, this was in 1810. Uh, I think it wasn't until the 1820s that they started uh, uh, allowing for convertibility at, at par again. Two years is pretty good lease for people to have of this sort. This bank promises to pay on demand. It does this upon the face of every one of its notes, and therefore, as a remedy for the evil of want of gold, to propose that this bank should begin to pay in two years' time it is something which I think would not have been offered to the public in any age but this, and even in this age, at any public except the public in this country. The notes of the Bank of England bear upon the face of them a promise that the bankers or bank company who issued the notes will pay the notes upon demand. Now, what do we mean by paying a note? Certainly, we do not mean the giving of one note for another note. Uh, I found that quite interesting, giving one note for another note, because uh, if you look at the Bank of England note, even today, uh, over 200 years after he wrote this pamphlet, or the letters, was 1810, 210 years, uh, the Bank of England uh, note still has that promise. It says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. I've called the Bank of England many times and asked him, uh, 
does that mean that you pay in money or gold or silver? They said, no, we, we've gone off, off the gold standard. Uh, UK coins are not silver anymore. All that means is you, you can bring your uh, old note and get a new note. So they were doing the same thing in 1810 as they're doing in 2010. I found that really interesting. Is it any wonder that uh, the letters uh, by William Cobbett are not really very well known, probably not taught in schools and universities in this country. I can't say for sure, because I, I grew up in Brazil. I went to, uh, uh, didn't go to school in this country. Yet, this is the sort of payment that people get at the Bank of England. <laughs> and this sort of payment, the bullying committee does not propose even to begin to put an end to in less than two years from this time. So what he's saying here is they, they're they uh, proposing that uh, the convertibility be uh, once again put back, uh, that uh, you can take your notes to uh, Bank of England or any other bank and get uh, coin, uh, gold or silver or money as he calls it, that's real money, uh, at par, at the face value of the notes uh, and at the same time, have this kind of uh, musical chair where they give you paper for paper, right? Gentlemen, we the people of this country have been persuaded to believe many things. We have been persuaded to believe ourselves to be the most thinking people in Europe. But to what purpose do men think unless they arrive at useful knowledge by thinking? To what purpose do men think if they are, after all their thinking, to be persuaded that a bank which has not paid its promissory notes in gold for 13 years and a half will be able to pay them in gold at the end of 15 years and a half? The quantity of the notes having gone on regularly increasing. If men are to be persuaded to believe this, to what purpose do they think? But before I proceed any further in my remarks upon the report of the Bullion Committee, before I proceed to lay before you the exposures now made by the labors of this committee, the fact now become evident, the facts now become evident through this channel the confessions now made by these members of the House of Commons. Before I proceed to lay these before you and to remark upon the remedies prepared by the committee, it will be necessary for me to go back into the history of paper money because without doing this, I shall be talking to you of things of which you will have no clear uh, notion and the reasonings relating to which you will, of course, not at all understand. It is a great misfortune that any portion of your time should be spent in reading or thinking about matters of this kind, but such is our present situation in this country that every man who has a family to preserve from want ought to endeavor to make himself acquainted with the nature and with the probable consequences of the paper money now afloat. So he's trying to warn people about the um, pitfalls, the evils of paper money or fiat currency. Money is the representative or the token of property or things of value. The money, while used as money, is of no other use and therefore a bit of lead or of wood or of leather would be as good as gold or silver to be used as money. But if these materials, which are everywhere found in such abundance, were to be used as money, there would be so much money made that there would be no end to it. And besides, the money made in one country would, however, there enforced by law have no value in any other country. 
For these reasons, gold and silver, which are amongst the most scarce of things, have been by all the nations that we know anything of used as money. So there you go. William Cobbett knew what money was, at least knew how important gold and silver were in terms of money. While the money of any country consists of nothing but these scarce metals, while it consists of nothing but gold and silver, there is no fear of it becoming too abundant. But if the money of a country be made of lead, tin, wool, leather, or paper, and if anyone can make it who may choose to make it, there needs no extraordinary wisdom to foresee that there will be a great abundance of this sort of money. And of course, uh, nowadays, uh, the paper money, you could call it a digital entry, and even the, the notes, some of them are not, not really made of paper. Uh, I think uh, the dollar bills are like cotton or something. But anyway, and that the gold and silver money being in fact no longer of any use in such a state of things will go either into the hordes of the prudent or into the bags of those who have the means of sending it or carrying them to those foreign countries where they are wanted or where they will bring their value. That a state of things like that here spoken of does now exist in this country is notorious to all the world. Well, now it, it's existing, of course, not only in this country again, but all around the world, the United States included. But while we are all acquainted with the fact, and while many of us are most sensibly feeling the effects, scarcely a man amongst us takes the trouble to inquire into the cause. Yet, unless the cause be ascertained, how are we to apply or to judge of a remedy? We see the country abounding with paper money. We see every man's hand full of it. We frequently talk of it as a strange thing and a great evil. But never do we inquire into the cause of it. So that's the same thing happening nowadays. I know they want to go cashless, but it's going to be trillions. One day will be quadrillions of uh, dollars, pounds, and euros. Uh, it's not going to be paper anymore, it looks like it, but it's still going to be very abundant. There are few of you who cannot remember the time when there was scarcely ever seen a banknote among tradesmen and farmers. I can remember when this was the case and when the farmers in my country hardly ever saw a banknote except when they sold their hops at Wayhill Fair. People in those days used to carry little bags to put their money in. Instead of the pasteboard or leather cases that they now carry, if you look back and take a little time to think, you will trace the gradual increase of paper money and the like decrease of gold and silver money. At first, there were no banknotes under 20 pounds and no banknotes. Next, they came to 15 pounds, next to 10 pounds. At the beginning of the last war, they came to 5 pounds. And before the end, they came down to 2 and to 1 pounds. How long will it be before they come down to parts of a pound? It would perhaps be difficult to say. But in Kent, at least there are country notes in circulation to an amount so low as that of seven shillings. I think there are 20 shillings to the pound. It is the cause of this that is interesting to us. The cause of this change in our money and in the prices of goods of all sorts and of labor. All of you who are 40 years of age can remember when the price of the gallon loaf used to be about 10 pence or a shilling instead of two shillings and six pence or two shillings and 10 pence as it is now. These effects strike you. You talk of them every day, 
but the cause of them you seldom, if ever, either talk or think of. And it is to this cause that I am now endeavoring to draw your attention. So it's like nowadays people are always talking about prices going up or even shrinkflation, which is uh, the amount of goods that you get goes down, but the price doesn't change. So nothing's changed in 210 years. You have, during the last 17 years, seen the quantity of paper money rapidly increase, or in other words, you have day after day seen less and less of gold and silver appearing in payments, and of course, more and more of paper money. But it was not until 1797 that paper money began to increase so very fast. It was then that the two and one pound notes were first made by the Bank of England. It was then, in short, that paper money became completely predominant. But you will naturally ask me, what was the cause of that? The cause was that the Bank of England stopped paying its notes in gold and silver. What? <laughs> stop paying its notes, refuse to pay in promissory notes. The Bank of England, when its notes were presented, refused to pay them. Yes, and what is more, an act of parliament brought in by Pitt, uh, prime minister, was passed to protect the Bank of England against the legal consequences of such refusal. So yeah, the parliament, Politicians were helping the bankers even back in 1797. Uh, they're also helping the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they have been helping them since the 80s. And uh, I saw Bill Gates saying that uh, uh, governments should uh, make uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, immune from prosecution. And who had perhaps given gold or silver for them when they went to the bank for payment, were told that they could have no gold or silver, but that they might have other notes, more paper. If they pleased, in exchange for the paper they held in their hands and tendered for payment. From that time to this, the Act of Parliament authorizing the Bank of England to refuse to pay its notes in gold and silver, or money really, real money, has been in force. At first, it was passed for three months. <laughs> Next, till the parliament should meet again. Then it was to last to the end of the war. Then when peace came, it was continued for just a year till things should be settled. Then as things were not quite settled, then as things were, it was continued till parliament should meet again. And as this present war had begun by that time, the act was made to continue till six months after the next peace. The reason given upon the different occasions, it will be very material to notice, for it is this stoppage in the payment of gold and silver at the Bank of England upon which the whole question turns. Everything hangs upon this. And when we come to examine that part of the report which treats the banks reviving its payments in gold and silver, we shall find it of great use to us to recur to the reasons, the diverse, the manifold reasons that were given at different times for suspending those payments. Since the suspension took place, you have seen the gold and silver disappear. You have seen the paper has supplied the place of gold. Paper money makers have set up all over the kingdom. And might not this well happen when to pay paper money, nothing more than paper money was required? But the reason given for this measure of suspension, uh, the reasons given for the passing of the Act of Parliament to protect the Bank of England against the demands of its creditors are seldom recurred to. 
though as you will presently see without recurring to those reasons and without ascertaining the true cause of the passing of the Act of Parliament, we cannot form so good a judgment relative to the remedy now proposed, namely that the Bank of England's reviving its payments in gold and silver. This is the remedy which the Bullion Committee propose, and you will say a very good remedy it is, a very good remedy indeed. For people who have for so long a time not paid their notes in gold and silver to begin to pay their notes in gold and silver is a very good remedy. But the thing to ascertain is, can the remedy be applied? This is the question for us to discuss. It required nobody to tell us that paying gold and silver would be an effectual remedy for the evils arising from not paying gold and silver. But it required much more than I have yet heard to convince me that to pay again in gold and silver was possible. The chief object of our inquiries being this, whether it be possible without a total destruction of all the paper money to restore gold and silver to circulation amongst us. This being the chief object of our inquiries, we should first ascertain how the gold and silver was driven out of circulation and had its place supplied by paper money. For unless we get at a clear view of this, it will be next to impossible for us to reason satisfactorily upon the means of bringing gold and silver back into circulation. Some people suppose that paper money always made a part of the currency or common money of England. That's interesting because nowadays it's the same thing. People think uh, they look at these. They never realized that gold and silver were part of this. Uh, so even back then, and it eventually came back. So who's to say that it won't come back, gold and silver? Because it had gone away for some time back in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. They seem to regard the Bank of England as being as old <laughs> as the Church of England, at least. And some of them appear to have full as much veneration for it. Sounds familiar nowadays. The truth is, however, that the Bank of England is a mere human institution arising out of causes having nothing miraculous or supernatural about them and that both the institution and the agents who carry it on are as mortal as any other thing or any other man in this or any other country. The bank, as it is called, had its origin in the year 1694, that is 116 years ago, and it arose thus, the then King William III who had come from Holland, had begun a war against France and wanting money to carry it on, an act was passed to invite people to make voluntary advances to the government of the sum of £1,500,000. And that was in real money, of course, gold and silver. And for securing the payment of the interest and also for securing the repayment of the principal, taxes were laid upon beer, ale, and other liquors upon condition of £1,200,000 of this money being advanced within a certain time, the subscribers to the loan were to be incorporated. And as the money was advanced in due time, the incorporation took place and the lenders of the money were formed into a trading company called the Governor and Company of the Bank of England. Out of this and other sums borrowed by the government in the way of mortgage upon the taxes, there grew up a thing called the stocks or the funds for which we will speak hereafter. But the bank company remained under its primitive name and as the debt of the nation increased, this company increased in riches, 
and in consequence. And that continues to its day, of course, <laughs> with the debt uh, being, um, I think uh, William Cobbett would be surprised where the national debt is today. Thus you see, and it is well worthy of your attention, the bank had its rise in war and taxation. There you go. Is it any wonder that uh, we still call, uh, well, not everyone, but a lot of us know that uh, all wars really are bankers' wars. <laughs> Maybe that's why William Cobbett is not that popular in the popular culture or in academia anymore. But we must reserve reflections of this sort for other occasions and go on with our inquiries how gold and silver have been driven out of circulation in this country. Or in other words, how it came to pass that so much paper money got afloat. The Act of Parliament, which I have just referred to, points out the manner in which the bank company shall carry on their trade and the articles in which they shall trade allowing them, amongst other things, to trade in gold, silver, bills of exchange, and other things under certain restrictions. But as to what are called banknotes, the company was not empowered to issue any such in any other way or upon any other footing than merely as promissory notes for the amount of which in the coin of the country, they were liable to be sued and arrested. Having, however, a greater credit than any other individuals or company of individuals, the bank company issued notes to a greater amount and which was something new in England. They were made payable not to any particular person or his order and not at any particular time, but to the bearer and on demand. So here we go. That promise is still on the banknotes today. These characteristics which distinguish the promissory notes of the Bank of England from all other promissory notes gave the people greater confidence in them. And as the bank company were always ready to pay the notes in gold and silver when presented for payment, the notes became in time to be looked upon as being as good as gold and silver. It's the same thing with the dollar. Back in the uh, pre-1971 uh, closing of the gold window, people used to say that the dollar was as good as gold. Here come our country sayings. As good as the bank as solid as the bank, and the like. Yet the bank was, as we have seen, merely a company of mortal men formed into an association of traders, and their notes, nothing more than written promises to pay the bearer so much money in gold and silver. We used to have other sayings about the bank, such as, as rich as the bank, all the gold is in the bank, and such like, always conveying a notion that the bank was a place, and a place, too, where there were great heaps of money. As long as the company were ready and willing to pay, and did actually pay their notes in gold and silver to all those persons who wished to have gold and silver, it is clear that these opinions of the people relative to the bank were not altogether unfounded. For though uh, no bit of paper or anything which has no value in itself can be, in fact, so good as a bit of gold, <laughs> still, if it will, at any moment, whenever the holder pleases, bring him gold or silver to the amount written upon it, it is very nearly as good as gold and silver. I remember uh, back in 2002, you could get um, a tenth of a sovereign with this. A sovereign was 50 pounds. So you needed 10 of these to get a sovereign. But nowadays, the sovereign is 365 to get it. 
So uh, that just means that they're inflating the system. Don't get uh, distracted by this talk of deflation. They're inflating the system. And at the time of which we're speaking, this was the case with the promissory notes of the bank company. But it must be evident that though the company were ready at the time now referred to to pay their notes in gold and silver, they had never in their money chests a sufficiency of gold and silver to pay off all their notes. If they had been presented all at once, this must be evident to every man because if the bank company kept locked up as much gold and silver as their notes amounted to, they could get nothing by issuing their notes and might full as well have sent out their gold and silver. A farmer, for instance, who's generally using a hundred pounds of money to pay his workmen, might lend the hundred pounds and get interest for it. If he could persuade his workmen to take promissory notes of his own drawing instead of money, and if he were sure that the promissory notes would not be brought in for payment, but if this was not the case, he would be compelled to keep the hundred pounds in his drawer, ready to give to those who did not like to keep his promissory notes. And in such case, it is clear that the money would be of no use to them and that he might full as well have not his notes out. Just so with the bank company, who at no time could have in hand gold and silver enough to pay off all their notes at once, nor was this necessary as long as the people regarded those notes as being equally good with gold and silver. But it is clear that this opinion of the goodness of the company's notes, or rather the feeling of confidence, or still more properly perhaps the absence of all suspicion with respect to them, must in a great degree depend upon the quantity of notes seen in circulation compared with the quantity of gold and silver seen in circulation. At first, the quantity of notes was very small indeed. The increase of this quantity was, for the first 20 years, very slow. And though it became more rapid in the next 20 years, the quantity does not appear to have been large till the war which took place in 1755, before which the bank company put out no notes under 20 pounds in the amount. Then it was that they began to put out 15 pound notes and afterwards, but during the same war, 10 pound notes. During all this time, loans in every war had been made by the government. This is to say the government had borrowed money of individuals in the same way as above mentioned in the year 1694. The money thus borrowed was never paid off, but was suffered to remain at interest and was, as it is now, called the national debt. The interest upon which is annually paid out of the taxes raised upon the people. Is it any wonder they're talking about raising taxes already with all the debt and money they've pumped into the system? in the last few months. As this debt went on increasing, the banknotes went on increasing, as indeed it is evident they must, seeing that the interest of the debt was, as it still is and must be paid in banknotes. It is not simply the quantity of banknotes that are put into circulation, which will excite alarm as to their solidity but it is the quantity, if it be great, compared with the quantity of gold and silver seen in circulation. Well, that's even more worrying nowadays, seeing also that Gordon Brown sold half this country's gold um, back uh, almost 20 years ago now. Yeah, granted, the Bank of England holds about 5,000 tons of gold for other countries, 
uh, yeah, maybe, um, you know, the precedent with Venezuela, maybe other countries should be a, a bit worried about the Bank of England holding their gold. There's the, that old saying about possession being nine-tenths of, of the law. And we've seen that um, the High Court in England uh, judged in, um, bank, in the Bank of England's uh, favor. So they've basically confiscated uh, Venezuela's gold at the Bank of England. So if as the banknotes increased, the circulating gold and silver had increased in the same proportion, then indeed banknotes would still have retained their usual credit. People still have had the same confidence in them. But this could not be for the nature of things. It could not be the cause of the increase of the bank notes was the increase of the interest upon the national debt. And as it grew out of an operation occasioned by poverty, so he's saying only people who are poor need to borrow, right? It would have been strange indeed had it been accompanied with a circumstance which would have been an infallible indication of riches. I really like that. He, He's saying, uh, if someone is so rich, how come he's borrowing even more, right? Just keep that in mind about all the national debts out there, including the US, the UK, Europe, Japan. Without, however, stopping here to inquire into the cause of the coins, not increasing with the increase of paper, suffice it to say that such was the fact Year after year, we saw more of banknotes and less of gold and silver, till in time, such was the quantity of banknotes required to meet the purposes of gold and silver in the payment of the interest of this still increasing debt and in the payment of the taxes. Many other banks were opened and they were also issued promissory notes. The bank company's notes which had never before been made for less sums than 10 pounds, were soon after the beginning of Pitt's War in 1793, issued for five pounds, after which it was not to be supposed that people could have the same opinion of banknotes that they formerly had. Every part of the people except the very poorest of them now occasionally at least possessed bank notes. Rents, salaries, yearly wages, all sums above five pounds were now paid in bank notes and the government itself was now paid its taxes in the same sort of currency. In such a state of things, it was quite impossible that people should not begin to perceive that gold and silver was better than bank notes and they should not be more desirous of possessing the former than the latter. And the moment this is the case, the banking system must begin to tremble, for as the notes are payable to the bearer and payable on demand, it is very certain that no man with such preference in his mind will keep in his possession a banknote unless we can suppose a man so absurd as to keep a thing of the goodness of which he has a suspicion while for merely opening his mouth or stretching forth his hand he can exchange it for a thing of the same nominal value and of the goodness of which it is impossible for him or anyone else to entertain any suspicion while well, gold and silver right you stretch out that bank note and they have to pay you in gold and silver. Public credit, as it has been called, but as it may more properly be called the credit of bank notes, has been emphatically denominated suspicion asleep. In the midst of events like those of 1793 and the years immediately succeeding, in the midst of circumstances like those above mentioned relating to the banknotes, it was impossible that suspicion should keep any longer. 
the putting forth of the five pound banknotes appears to have roused it. And in the month of February 1797, it became broad awake. The stoppage of payment on the part of the bank company was the immediate consequence. But a particular account of the important event, which totally changed the nature of all money transactions and which will in the end produce in all human probability effects of the most serious nature must be subject of a future letter. In the meantime, while I am your friend, William Cobbett. So there you go. <laughs> I guess uh, 1797, uh, Bank of England uh, defaulted. And uh, it was only an act of parliament that helped uh, them uh, stay in business and not be prosecuted. Uh, the Bank of England should should have been put in its officers and whoever was involved in the Bank of England or even shareholders, they should have been uh, liable and maybe uh, even put in debtor's uh, prison, but they weren't. So uh, I won't keep you any longer. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Parlay, and all these other platforms below here. I wish you all a great weekend. Take care. Bye.